So welcome to another artist talk sponsored by the Catherine L. Hyde Foundation. Today we have an artist talk by Sarah Gross, who is the artist that's currently featured within the gallery. Her show Fruits of Labor is a show that will be the center of the focus of the talk, but um, also one that you can view after the talk because we do have a reception from seven to eight. Sarah Gross grew up in a small apartment in a densely populated New York City. Her work explores physical closeness and emotional distance. Her ceramic sculpture and installation reveals a discomfort with and longing for intimacy. She shows her work nationally and internationally and is included in numerous collections, including in the U.S. Department of State, University of Costa Rica, and the Xiwan Ceramics Museum in China. Sarah is an associate professor of visual art at the University of Kansas. Her investigation of labor in this exhibition considered a spectrum of definitions and understandings, including traditionally masculine labor, such as bricklaying, traditionally feminine labor and um, feminine labor and childbirth, and the virtuous morality that is associated with hard work. She uses conflicting layers of informative or information to invite questions and conversation. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, Christine and the students at MSSU have been so helpful in putting this show up. And um, I'm very excited to give this talk. I've never given an online talk before. And um, it's a chance for my family and friends who ordinarily are far away and don't get to see these artist talks um, to actually kind of see what I do. Um, and so my, my family and friends are also in attendance. Thank you for coming. Um, so I included, for those of you who aren't able to actually see the gallery, a couple of um, shots just of the, the general layout of the space you can see. Um, there are some pieces on the walls. Um, there are some vessels on pedestals. There's an installation on the floor. This is the other side of the room. You can't see all of the walls. And as I was preparing this talk, I was like, how am I going to really get all of this into words? How am I going to talk about all of the ideas that are um, contributing to this show? Maybe I'll try to make a Venn diagram. And um, I tried and it really didn't work <laughs> because this isn't really a Venn diagram. Um, but some of the themes that um, you'll see in the work and hear me talk about in this um, lecture tonight um, are themes and intersecting ideas of motherhood, growth and fertility, labor, and also time. Um, and just to give you a more jumbled slide with a lot of words on it to help kind of connect a little bit more on those themes. Um, I'm thinking about motherhood, as I said, fertility, both of plants and pregnancy. I'm thinking about the metaphor of fruit as a, a metaphor for sexuality. Um, thinking about labor, I'm, I'm talking about manual labor, childbirth. Um, the works in this show are um, created to think about making labor seen and making labor felt. Um, I'm thinking about time, different notions of time, like cyclical time, like the seasons and how they circle back and also linear time where, you know, we're kind of like on this line with the past behind us and the future ahead of us. Um, and often when I'm thinking about the future, it's with anxiety. And so I think there's a little bit of that in this work. Um, also themes of pottery and accumulation, um, harvest as another form of accumulation, which you'll see in the work. Um, and broadly, just the idea of leaving a mark and the way that I think about um, my job as a mother um, and everything I do as a mother leaves a mark on um, my daughter. And it's also like by having a daughter, it makes me think about the way I'm leaving a mark on the world just with her existence. 
um, and motherhood and unknown futures also connect to like leaving a mark and wanting to have it have a a mark there after I'm gone and I think those are kind of common common drives um so as Christine mentioned I grew up in New York City and uh, this is the apartment building where I grew up um you'll notice it's made of bricks and um this is where I live now on the right this is my house and this is my garden and um this became a serious garden a few years ago when the pandemic started. Um, I got more and more into growing fruits and vegetables and flowers. And in a time when everything in the future was just kind of scary, like not knowing what was going to happen with COVID and um, especially worrying about my family in New York City, um, getting sick and not not being able to like go outside and get fresh air. Um, it was a very fearful time and working in my garden was a way for me to think about the future with optimism. I knew that like if I put a seed in the ground, it would grow and it would produce something. Um, and the works in this show show images of harvest. Um, and so when I think about harvest, I'm thinking about, again, that idea of fertility and the idea of accumulation, like a harvest happens and all of a sudden you have mounds and mounds of fruit and vegetables. And also harvest is associated with a specific time and it's a cyclical time. The harvest comes, you know, every year, like every season, there's a, there's a particular harvest. Um, and again, talking about my role as a mother, this is my daughter, Marigold, um, maybe a year or two ago, eating up all the tomatoes in the garden. And um, she she has just made a huge mark on me. And she, in a lot of ways, represents the future to me. Um, she's also my present. She's how I spend my time. And she loves eating cherry tomatoes that we grow in the garden. Going back a little bit, um, I was trained as a potter. I make ceramic sculpture now, but my artistic roots are in functional pottery. And when you're being educated in this way and thinking about functional pottery, you're always in the same way thinking about accumulation. Um, you never make one bowl. You make you know 10 bowls or 50 bowls or 100 bowls. And um, that, I think, has continued to inform my work forever. Um, I'm, I'm always just finding myself repeating things and piling things up and creating mounds and encrustations. And you'll see that in the works in this show. Um, and the works on pedestals in this show are focused around vessels we use in the garden. And in these images, Marigold is going to be a handy model. Um, so here's an example of one of the pieces, which is a much more um, formal garden vessel. And it has some leaves dripping over it, some abstracted leaves and some um, fruit sitting on the pedestal next to it, which is a, a reference to sexuality. Um, and here is my daughter standing in a bamboo um, structure. And I just see there's a couple of things in the chat. Oh, I see. Okay, just making sure I wasn't missing out on a question or something. Um, and so this is Marigold standing um, last spring in this bamboo structure. And here's this bamboo structure just like two months later. And so observing living in Kansas, the way plants will just grow, like you don't even have to do anything. They just take over and they cover surfaces. And the summers here are so lush and green. Um, and so that's been really impactful on my work and the, the things that I'm paying attention to, it's just the spaces around me. Um, and so thinking about like this 
structure being um, covered. Then I began covering these garden vessels. Um, this, this piece is titled flower pot. So it's almost like a pot and a flower in one, or maybe it's been um, covered with a uh, growth like that, that TP in my front yard. And, and these are, you know, sexual references as well um, and references to reprodu reproduction and childbirth. And so this has a companion piece um, called dilated flower pot to talk about the process that the body goes through during childbirth. And here's a close up on that piece. Um, again, going back to other garden veg or garden vessels as illustrated by Marigold, this piece is titled Basket. And here's Marigold digging up a bunch of potatoes that we grew last year. And this piece is titled Vanitas number two. So it's also um, with Vanitas that is talking about um, a work of art that is a reminder of um, our own mortality. Um, I love to grow flowers in my garden. I especially like to grow dahlias. And um, I think it's another beautiful artistic practice to arrange them. And so I've also made um, sculptures dealing with um, creating a formal composition and also where the vessel itself is covered with petals or leaves. Um, a lot of the ideas that I'm working with in the show uh, kind of started in the fall of 2018. Um, I did an artist residency in Rome, in Italy, um, and I was also pregnant at the time. And so I was moving through the city and also working in the studio and seeing um, all of this architectural ornamentation and specifically plants represented in architecture. And I got interested in the idea of um, plants carved in stone and the idea of them never changing um, and also fruits carved in stone. And that made me think about, you know, my own pregnant stomach. Um, and so this is Tragit's column in Rome and the base of the column is a wreath made out of laurel wreaths or laurel leaves. And um, that's a symbol of victory. This is like a column to celebrate a military victory. And um, in this show, you'll see I have four wreaths kind of representing the four seasons. And so this wreath is um, covered with artichokes and it's uh, to represent the spring harvest. This one is covered with tomatoes. And so that's the summer harvest. And the fall harvest is these squash and pumpkins. And the winter harvest is these clementines. And I was trying to come up with the words to think about wreaths. And I just, like you do, I went to Wikipedia and they just had the, um, it, exactly what I wanted to say, but, you know, more clear and precise and concise. So I just kind of dropped it in here. Wreaths originally were made for use with pagan rituals in Europe and were associated with the changing seasons and fertility. And so I think today we, um, when you think of a wreath, you, you'll often think of like a Christmas wreath, right? Um, but, and, and we often will hang a harvest wreath there. You know, I see wreaths um, hanging on doors year round with just different seasonal references to them, right? Um, but the roots of these wreaths, even, you know, when it's celebrating a Christian holiday, the roots are pagan. And so like, here's here's a statue um, from from Rome uh, of the, the Roman Emperor Claudius. And he's wearing a wreath made out of oak leaves to symbol, symbolize wisdom. And so going back to my wreaths that are in the gallery, um, it's important to look at them. Unfortunately, we, a lot of us can't do that right now, but to look at them um, in the rounds, to, to move around them, because the viewing experience changes as you move your body around the pieces. So 
from one side, they're bright and colorful and um, kind of juicy. And from the other side, they're this monochromatic kind of stony, slightly textured glaze. And so the it kind of goes back to that idea of the, those wreaths that they can be multiple things at once. Um, for me, I have also been thinking a lot about working in my garden and the climate and the future. Again, going back to unknowns and fear of the future. Um, and, you know, talking to other gardeners in my community, I'm very aware that um, a little bit to the west of where I live, and so like the west side is the side that we're looking at now, um, there, there is a drought, there's a water shortage. And I, you know, I often look to the west to get a sense of you know, is it going to rain? What what does the future hold? It seems to, you know, come from the West. And so that's why these have um, this glaze all on one side. It's it's kind of thinking about where the wind is coming from. And so here's a close up of one of these um, wreaths, the artichoke wreath. And so as you can see, like one side is um, much more bright and colorful and glossy and the other side has this um, gray stony glaze on it. Um, another architectural embellishment that I saw a lot in Rome, this is, this is a terrible image, but it happened to be the reference image I used for the pieces in the gallery, um, are festoons or garlands, um, just like heavy with fruit. And um, this one I selected, for, it's, it's, on a church in the Netherlands. It's not um, one that I've seen in person like when I was doing that residency in Rome. Um, but this one has the like extremely heavy bulbous volume that I wanted. And so um, this is what I used to create the pieces that are in the gallery now. Um, if there's time, I have some process images to show you what this um, construction process was like because they're produced with a mold. Um, the title of this piece is Festoon Summering. And um, like the wreaths, when it's viewed from one side, it's much more monochromatic and um, kind of stony. And you know, I, I apologize for the quality of this photo. I took this with my phone, so it's not as good, but from the other side, it's much more colorful. So it's doing the same um, thing with that like kind of changing and lack of stability that um, the viewing experience has with the wreaths. And here's the counterpart to the previous festoon. This one is called Festoon Wintering. And um, this piece is made just with clay that um, has a lot of soluble salts in it and the salts will kind of come to the surface and create this like frosty white crust and so um this is to think about the times in the winter when everything is bare and um the the structures underneath are revealed there's a detail on that it's also important to me i'm using the same kind of clay that like flower pots are made out of this is terracotta Um, this piece is called March to or March to November or December. I think it's March to November. Excuse me. I, I put these notes in today, so I might have been a little bit rushed. But again, some of those themes that I'm coming back to, the ideas of time, um, and the, the, the title is a play on words, you know, the gardening season, the growing season, um, accumulation, where it's it's like a picture of a harvest. Um, and also like fertility and sexuality, you know, like there's this melon that's like very vaginal and there's seeds inside. Um, and now I'm going to talk about the piece that's in the center of the gallery on the floor, um, which is a brick installation. And so this is a sidewalk near where I live. This is, this is a sidewalk, like a, a very kind of typical sidewalk in my neighborhood in Lawrence, Kansas. Bricks! As a clay geek and, you know, somebody who's been working in clay for 
a long time. Um, I can't help but just pay attention and geek out about clay and ceramic objects in our environment. And when I was starting this project, I got to visit um, a brick factory um, a few hours away from where I live, Kansas Brick and Tile in Concordia, Kansas. And um, it was really exciting to me as a you know clay geek to, to see a factory here in, in my state where bricks are being produced. This is, um, you know, in the kiln or like the antechamber to the kiln as the bricks are drying and getting ready to be fired in the kiln. Um, this is the kiln, which is made of bricks and which also kind of reminded me of the idea of like my flower pot, which is encrusted with flowers or made of made of what it makes in a sense. Um, and so, yeah, I just had to include this photo because I was beside myself with glee walking around this brick factory. And over the past number of months, I've been making my own bricks. Um, and so this this installation on the floor is called Course of Action, um, which is a play on words um, because uh, brick layers. I also interviewed a a mason when I was working on this project um they they talk about like a course of bricks as being like one one level um in in a installation or in a in a wall for instance and so you'll notice that every single one of these bricks has a mark in it and it's a mark from my hand um some of them look like you know what would happen if you were like really squeezing the clay really hard, like making a fist when you're angry. Each one of them kind of represents like an emotion or a moment in time, a singular gesture. Um, and then accumulated together, they make this walking path. And the idea of leaving a hand or a finger impression in clay is something that is... Uh, very relevant to clay geeks like me. And um, so I just wanted to show you a couple of images of historical and contemporary pot. Um, so these kinds of finger marks are ways to connect with people who made things um, even thousands of years ago. Like th this is a thousands of years old vessel from Egypt. And you can see this sort of like pie crust texture, this wavy handle that's formed where you can match up your finger with the, the maker of the finger who made it however many years ago. Um, same idea, this handle, which has these impressions from the thumb of a maker um, from 16th or 17th century Britain. And then this photo on the right, I took this morning in my class. Um, my student Ariana made this mug and she's still leaving these fresh clay finger marks in her handles um, because it's important to her. It's, it's a way of um, showing that something was made by hand and it was made by a human. Um, and the person who buys that mug and uses it is going to match up their finger to Ariana's, even if they never meet. And so I think that all of those ideas about um, connecting with other people and also recording a moment in time and leaving a record of yourself, the same way like uh, you see handprints in wet cement, for instance, or graffiti. It's a way of saying, I was here. Um, and this is an image of some of the MSSU students and my assistant Hunter, as we were installing this piece, it was really funny because we were um, brushing this faux mortar, which is just play sand, um, off of the surfaces of the bricks. And um, it was kind of like an archaeological dig, you know, like we were like a bunch of paleontologists. Um, but uh, I also was thinking about Hunter in this image here. Hunter's from Mississippi. And um, when I was working on this project early on, he told me about how, oh, how am I doing on time? Good. Uh, he told me about how at the University of Mississippi, 
there are a lot of old brick buildings and um, the buildings were made by enslaved people and the bricks were made by enslaved people. And you can see their hands, you can see their fingerprints in the clay. Um, and recently I was at um, the new museum in New York to see this exhibit by one of my favorite artists, the Astor Gates. And um, even there he featured in his collection, this brick that was made by someone back in the 1870s. And that person just decided to leave these fresh fingerprints in that wet clay. And um, I think that's just like such a human impulse that we can all still understand and connect with. Um, and I loved that uh, brick factory in Concordia, Kansas. But, um, and the reason I was visiting there was to see if I could um, maybe develop some sort of collaboration with them. Um, and I, I got to meet the people who make these bricks. And, you know, these are made by people, even though there, there's um, machines as intermediaries. But I'm, I'm left cold by the absence of touch. I think, you know, the people who made these are not visible. And so that's what drove the making of that installation course of action was making myself visible and making my labor visible. Um, and then just a couple more pictures of my garden because um, growing up in New York City, uh, I didn't get a chance to really get to know my neighbors. And um, also in the pandemic, we were all keeping away from each other unless you are outdoors right and so working in my garden and um spending time just weeding and planting things and checking on my plants gave me an opportunity to meet people and i really met so many of my neighbors through the practice of gardening and um so that was also you know a kind of a public form of labor that enabled me to connect with the people in my community. You know, they would just be like, great job. <laughs> Your flowers are gorgeous. Um, and this is an image of Marigold in the pumpkin patch, but I think it's an important image for me because it, it makes me think about a storm that's coming. Um, as I was saying, like the way storms here you can see them coming and they're coming from the west and um it is just a great sort of stand-in photograph of what gardening can give us you know it connects us to the earth it connects us to our neighbors um it connects us to the past and the future um, so much of the advice I've gotten about gardening has been from older people who are my teachers. And of course, as I, I mentioned, the um, practice of gardening is also sort of like this optimistic gesture to plant something and um, know that it's going to grow. And I did... I think I have time just to show a couple of images of how some of these pieces were made. Um, and then I'll uh, stop talking and turn off my screen sharing to answer any questions anybody has. Um, but the festoons um, that I showed you earlier were started with this as the reference image. I projected it onto a large sheet of paper and it's a little hard to see, but this is my sort of cartoon sketch um, tracing that projection, I covered that sheet of paper on my studio floor with a large sheet of plastic, and I slowly built up these solid clay forms, sometimes making very sort of representational, recognizable fruits and vegetables, and sometimes kind of taking my own um, liberties. After it was finished and I was satisfied with the composition, I took pieces of metal flashing and drove the metal 
into the clay to separate it, creating these little walls. So here's one, two, three, four, five, six. So this piece is broken down into um, seven separate units. And then I covered the um, clay sculptures um, or the, the clay sculpted areas with plaster to create a series of plaster molds. And so now I can create as many of these festoons as I want to, um, just what, with a mold making process. Um, a couple of images of the production of these wreaths as they were beginning to grow and get covered. And um, all of the vegetables and fruit on those wreaths were molded from real fruit instead of the sort of taking liberty with the festoon sculpture that I showed before. And um, finally, the repeat tile installation um, was uh, sketched out on paper, traced onto plastic. And if, if anybody has any questions about this process, um, I'll be happy to answer them. And built up to create a squared off tile, which when it's you know laid, laid out in repeat, um, the pattern will match up. Oh, and here is an image of that basket piece in the process of being um, overgrown and encrusted with these red clay leaves. And that is the end of my presentation. So I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has. Alex, hey. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thanks for uh, sharing your work. Um, I am very like um, pulled to that brick piece, the course of brick or whatever, or whatever the title course is for that. Action. Yeah, thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I think it's because we have that like shared experience of living in the same town, mm -hmm. but um. I have two questions about that, that piece. Uh, the first one is when you relate that to like potters leaving kind of their fingerprint um, in their work, um, I like that connection, but can you talk a little bit about like your touch is different than that because it's like more emotional, it's more like active. Um, and I just am kind of curious on while you make that connection, if you can talk just a little bit more about, you know, that emotion that goes into there. Thank you for that question, Alex. Um, that gives me a chance to tell you some truths. Um, so the original plan was not necessarily to make um, these repeating modules that were, you know, such a simple brick, you know, just something so recognizable. It was originally going to be something more decorative. Um, but then, um, the Supreme Court overruled Roe versus Wade, and I was very, very angry, and I still am. And those bricks became a way to record that anger. Um, those bricks became a way to act out that anger on a material that is um, kind of as associated with Western patriarchal values and masculinity. Great, that's good to hear. Um, and then also with that piece, um, you're using sand and the grout for that grout which I understand why, like you wouldn't necessarily want to like grout that and have to deal with that as a huge piece. Um, but is there any connection to that material and that kind of, um, uh, I guess, uh, temporariness of that? Um, and, and that's not just for installation purposes? Um, I mean, it definitely originated in, you know, sort of like I had a problem, I wanted to create 
something that looked like mortar and you know the solution was sand um but in installing it I became really interested in the way that it was kind of spilling out and creating these like little mini dunes on the gallery floor and, and to me you know that did speak of like time and I think sand is also kind of a symbol of time like sands through the hourglass and um so yeah I mean it it was sort of a I guess a happy accident where like a lot of my thoughts and intentions just kind of like crystallized and and just like it it was another layer that worked out really nicely well, again thanks for your presentation and uh i really like seeing all this new work thanks so much alex it's so nice to hear your voice any other questions Are there any questions on zoom Um, I have a question. Hi, Sarah. It's Jessica. Hey, Jessica. Thank for you. your presentation. It was so fabulous to see your exhibition. Um, my question is about the flower petals and the textures that are created with your flower petals. I found them so striking and I really wanted to touch them. And I also thought about scales and animals with scales and sort of um, I just wondered if you could talk more about the piece. I forget the name of it, but it was like the dilated flower petals and the one next to it. And a little bit more about that significance or the symbolism of the petals or the process of creating those or what um, those textures mean to you in relation to life. I'm also thinking, I'm sorry, this is very stream of conscious, but about how like snakes shed their skin and they had such a scale, a scale, scalar texture to them. So anyway, anything you want to share about the flower petals would be really interesting to hear. Thanks. Thanks, Jessica. Um, so I guess I'll start with the, the easy part, which is just talking you through the process. It's like, um, you know, such a simple like child's play kind of process. I just to take like a, a ball of clay, like a small ball of clay, like that and make it slightly egg shaped, press it into my palm and use my thumb to flatten it out. And then I just create a crease with a tool, but um, each one of them has, you know, the print of my finger and the inside of my palm impressed on it that might get covered up with glaze, but that's also, you know, part of part of the process that is recorded in each one of those petals or leaves. Um, I'm not, you know, sold on uh, committing to any one thing. I, I think, you know, I like having the possibility for different interpretations, like you're, you're talking about scales and um, snake skin. And um, while, while that's really, um, a snake skin is not what I'm thinking about. Um, the idea of that sounds rich and I like, I'm going to think about that in the future. Yeah, I'm like thinking of regeneration and generation. And I, I don't know, all of these images and textures and feelings came up for me when I was looking at those pieces. So... Thank you. But and, and it also enables me. Um, the the reason I started making those was because I've become like a crazy dahlia hobby grower, and there's this particular dahlia called Cafe Ole, and it's like the hot dahlia that everybody wants to grow. And um, part of it is because um, its petals kind of just like have this like romantic swaying pinwheeling in all directions texture and um it's just this flower that like when I look at it it just kind of makes me weak in the knees and it, it I wanted to own that texture and make that texture and you know explore the possibilities of 
creating those waves and directions. I think that's probably mm. it. Wow, thank you. Mm. Thanks, Jessica. Well, thank you so much for the talk. It was really wonderful and we've been grateful to have your work here. So the code word for today for my art history classes is sand. And <laughs> thank you again, Sarah. It's been great working with you. Thank you, Christine. It was so much fun. Your students are wonderful. <laughs> thank Thanks you. Thanks everyone for coming. Okay. So again, there's a reception that's starting now for about an hour and hopefully we'll see you over there because we do have food. And thanks for coming. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.